guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering maternity, but the wonderful thing about this video, I'm also going to be covering delegation. So we're gonna be killing two birds with one stone. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. So let's just jump right into the questions. First question, which client should the postpartum nurse assess first after receiving the AM shift report? One, the client who's complaining of perennial pain when urinating. Two, the client who saturated multiple peri pads during the night. Three, the client who's refusing to have the newborn in the room. Four, the client who's crying because the baby will not nurse. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is two, that patient who saturated multiple peri pads during the night. Why is that patient a priority? Because we're worried about them hemorrhaging, right? Remember back in my priority video, one of those patients I said are going to be a priority are patients who um, you suspect of bleeding out. Why? Because their physiological integrity is in question, okay? so. Our other choices, one, pain. Remember, I told you, pain never killed anyone except for three situations. Sickle cell, stones, or what was my third one? Burns. Okay, now add one more to that list, which is myocardial infarction. Because the pain of an MI is so bad, it increases the body's demands that the heart just can't deal with. Okay, so other than those four situations, pain never killed anyone. That patient's not going to be a a priority and those situations don't apply in that question so we're going to throw that out and then choices three or four three and four are both psych issues okay psych never killed anyone either so we're going to go to that patient that we're worried about that patient dying right away and that would be that patient that we're suspecting them bleeding out and that is choice number two next question which newborn infant would warrant immediate intervention by the nursery nurse one, the one hour old newborn who has abundant lanugo. Two, the six hour old newborn, newborn whose respirations are 52. Three, the 12 hour old newborn who's turning red and crying. Or four, the 24 hour old newborn who has not passed meconium. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is for that 24 hour old newborn who has a past meconium. We expect a newborn infant to pass meconium within that first 24 hours. And if they don't, we're concerned, we're ma worried maybe there's some kind of GI obstruction, maybe there's um, her sprungs happening or something else, but we need to check out that infant immediately if they have not passed that first stool. That first stool is what's known as meconium. Let's look at our other choices. You have one, the abundant lanugo, that's normal. Do you have two um, respirations of 52? Well, that's normal, respirations of 30 to 60, so that falls right in line. And then you have three, uh, the newborns turning red and crying. Well, the reason they're turning red is because they're crying, so that's normal. The only abnorm abnormality out of this would be that um, infant that has not passed that first stool yet. That's what we'd be concerned about the most. Next question, the client in labor is showing late decelerations on the fetal monitor. What intervention should the nurse implement first? One, notify the doctor immediately. Two, instruct the client to take slow deep breaths. Three, place the client in the left lateral position. Or four, prepare for an immediate delivery of the fetus. And the First thing you want to do in this situation is place the client on the left side, okay? Late decelerations, that is bad. What does that mean? That means that that fetus probably would not be able to handle true labor because what's happening? Mom's having those contractions, right? When mom's has those contractions, what the, what the fetus is supposed to do, the heart rate is supposed to accelerate. Okay, it's supposed to accelerate because when mom's having those contractions, the body of the feet is supposed to realize, whoa, I'm being squeezed, I need more oxygen, so the heart rate goes up to give the baby more oxygen. Fetus, I'm sorry guys, I keep saying baby. Please, I don't need anybody sending me any crazy messages in the comments, fetus, the, the baby's not born yet, so it's still a fetus. But anyway, 
What's supposed to happen is the heart rate is supposed to increase to bring more oxygen to the brain, to the, all the other organs of the fetus. But what's happening in late decelerations is that the contractions are happening and the heart rate isn't even speeding up until after the contractions are over or almost over. That's why it's called a late deceleration. So that is bad. So what do you want to do? Place mom on the left side. Because when you place her on the left side, that increases perfusion. It increases oxygenation. Okay? Telling the mom to take deep breaths and all that good stuff, that's wonderful. But the number one thing you want to do is place her on her left side. Okay? Next question. A 28-year-old female client is being scheduled for emergency appendect appendectomy. Which priority question should the emergency department nurse ask the client? One, are you currently breastfeeding? Two, have you ever had general anesthesia? Three, do you have any medication allergies? Or four, is there any chance you are pregnant? And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four, is there any chance you're pregnant? And the reason this is so important, this patient's about to go into surgery, which means they're about to get what? Anesthesia. So we have to make sure that she's not preg pregnant. So we're going to ask her if there's any chance that you can be pregnant, okay? And of course, um, we're gonna get urine and get an HCG just to make sure. Next question, the female unlicensed assistive personnel informs the nurse that she has helped the one day postpartum client change her peri pad three times in the last four hours. Which action should the nurse implement? One, ask the UAP why the nurse was not notified earlier. Two, go to the room and check the client immediately. Three, instruct the UAP to massage the client's uterus. Four, document the finding in the client's chart. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is two. So let me explain something to you. And guys, this is a concept that goes across the board in nursing. Whenever you have somebody come and tell you something about your patient that you are responsible for, you better get up and go get check that patient. Don't you dare tell whoever came to report something to you don't you dare tell them to go back and look at that patient don't you dare tell them to go back and do something for that patient you get up and you go check that patient that you are responsible for you hear me if you ever get a question and it's a UA uap a pct i don't care who it is and they come say nurse such and such i know this xyz about your patient your very first thing you're gonna do is go assess your patient. Go look for yourself so you can figure out what intervention you're gonna be doing for that patient, okay? So with that being said, let's look at our other choices. One, ask the UAP why the nurse was not notified earlier. You're delaying treatment. Who cares about why? We can deal with that later, right? Our priority is our patient. Choice number three, instruct the UAP to, massa to massage the client's uterus absolutely not you are going to go assess your patient to figure out what you're going to do for them next last choice document finding in the client's chart oh really so you're going to document the finding that somebody else told you about your patient that you're responsible for i don't think so you're going to get up and go check your that patient yourself and guys this goes across the board i don't care what the situation is anyone comes to tell you anything about your patient you go and check them okay Next question. The charge nurse is making assignments in the labor and delivery department. Which client should be assigned to the most experienced nurse? One, the 26 year old gestational client who's having Braxton Hicks contractions. Two, the 32 week gestational client who's having triplets and is on bed rest. Three, the 38 week gestational client who's contract, <laughs> I can't speak. Contractions are three minutes apart. Four, the 39-week gestational client who has late decelerations on the fetal monitor. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four. The patient is having late decelerations. I just told you, late decelerations is bad. So, of course, you want your most experienced nurse 
to have this patient, okay? Because this is a worst. Whenever you see a question asking you, who are you gonna give the most experienced nurse? What they're really asking you, which situation is the most critical? Which one's the worst? Which one do you need the best person on your team, okay? So let's look at our other choices. You have one, the 26 year old who's having Braxton Hicks contractions. Okay, well Braxton Hicks are just fake contractions. They're not real contractions. Let me explain something to you. Patients who are having Braxton Hicks con contractions, the minute that they rest, the contractions ease up. Real contractions, you can rest all you want. They're gonna progress, which means they get worse over time, okay? So Braxton Hicks contractions, those are fake contractions, that, that's not that bad. Then you have two, the woman who's having triplets, but she's on bed rest. That's not that bad. And then you have three, the woman who's having contractions and the contractions are three minutes apart. She's still three minutes apart. Between three and four, I'm going to choose four because we know that if the um, fetus is showing a late decelerations, that is a big problem. That is showing fetal distress. Okay, so I'm going to want the most experienced nurse on that team. Um, and if mom keeps having those fetal contractions, uh, fetal contractions, if mom, um, the, if the fetus keeps having those late decelerations, we might have to do an emergency C-section. Okay, because as I explained to you earlier, the fetus is not going to be able to survive childbirth otherwise. All right, next question. Which task should the nurse on the postpartum unit delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel? One, instruct the UAP to prepare a sits bath for the client. Two, ask the UAP to call the lab laboratory for a stat CBC count. Three, tell the UAP to show the mother how to breastfeed. Or four, have the UAP check the client's fundus. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, and the only answer that it could have been was one, prepare the sits bath, okay? A UAP, an unlicensed assistive personnel, that's a CNA, that's a PCT, anyone that's not licensed, okay? UAPs cannot do anything such as teaching, such as assessing, okay? They can't call the doctor for orders, okay? They certainly can't call lab with orders. Those orders that the lab would be called with, guess what? The nurse would be the one who'd have to call in those orders. And guess where the nurse got those orders from? The physician, okay? So that's why two, three, and four, two, three, and four are not even viable choices. The only choice would be one. That's the only thing that the CNA would not would would be allowed to do. Okay, CNA is. Let me back. Let me explain this to you. The RN cannot delegate to an unlicensed assistive personnel anything that includes assessing anything that includes teaching, okay? Anything that includes critical thinking, okay? Please make sure, if you haven't done so already, be sure to watch my video that I did on delegation. And I was very clear in that video, I explained what the unlicensed, unlicensed assistive personnel are, are allowed to do versus what the LPNs are allowed to do versus what the RN is not allowed to delegate to anyone else, the RNs have to keep those type of patients. So if you're kind of iffy about that, be sure to watch that video. Next question. A nurse from the medical surgical a nurse from the medical surgical unit is assigned to the postpartum unit. Which client should the charge nurse assign to the medical surgical nurse? One, the client who has developed mastitis and is trying to breastfeed. Two, the client who had a vaginal hysterectomy and oophorectomy. Three, the client who's having difficulty bonding with her infant. Or four, the unmarried client who's giving her child up for adoption. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is two, okay? The client who had a vaginal hysterectomy and oophorectomy. Um, so she got her uterus taken out and she got her um, fallopian tubes removed. Remo okay, let me explain something to you. 
sapling ectomy, excuse me. Let me explain something to you guys. Um, when it comes to matching nurses with patients, this is the rule of thumb. If it's a new grad, if it's an RN, but it's a brand new RN, it's an exper unexperienced RN, or it's an RN that has floated to your floor, you're gonna treat them like an LPN. Let me repeat that. If it's a new RN, it's an RN, they're brand new, they're inexperienced, okay? Let's say you have um, an RN student. They're not an RN yet, but they're a student. You have an RN student, or you have an RN that is floating to your floor. You're going to treat them like C, like CNAs, like LPNs. What do I mean when I say you're gonna treat them like LPNs? That means you're going to give them the most stable patient. Okay, remember how in my delegations video, I told you that LPNs, you're always going to give the LPN the routine patient. You're gonna give them the stable patient. Same thing here. If a RN is new, they're floating to your floor, it's a RN student, you're going to give them the most stable patient. There's only one time that this rule does not apply. It does not apply if you have an RN that's floating to your floor, but you happen to have a patient that matches that RN's background in this situation that I just gave you. So you have an RN that's floating to your floor, right? But you also have a patient that just had a hysterectomy. The RN that's floating to your floor is coming from what? The medical, what? Surgical unit, which means she's used to taking patient, taking care of patients that just had surgery. So that patient lines right up with that patient that's floating from the med surge floor, okay? I wanna show you something. Let's look at our other choices. The other choices were um, a mom with mastitis, a mom that's not bonding, or a mom um, that's giving her up her child for adoption. All of those situations, you need a nurse that has experience on the maternity floor, that has seen this before, that knows what to do, okay? You're not gonna give that to a nurse that just floated down from the med surge unit. But that patient who just had a surgical procedure is right up her alley. That's who you're gonna match up with the, with the nurse, with the floating nurse. The nurse working in a women's health clinic is returning telephone calls. Which client should the nurse contact first? One, the 16-year-old client who's complaining of severe lower abdominal cramping. Two, the 27-year-old preemie gravida who's complaining of blurred vision. Three, the 48-year-old perimenopausal client who's expelling dark red blood clots. Or four, the 68-year-old client who thinks her uterus is falling out of her vagina. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And I hope you guys chose two, the 27-year-old preemie gravida client who's complaining of blurred vision. So we have a pregnant mom. This is her first time, pr first time being pregnant and she's complaining of blurred vision. What are we concerned about? We're concerned about preeclampsia, okay? That blurred vision or severe headache, those are signs and symptoms of preeclampsia and that will um, affect that patient's what? Physiologic integrity, right? So that's who you're gonna be running to. The other choices can wait, but not that patient that we suspect of preeclampsia, okay? We're gonna be running to them. Next question. The charge nurse has received a laboratory result for the clients on the postpartum unit. Which client would warrant intervention by the nurse? One, the client whose WBCs are 18,000. Two, the client whose serum creatinine level 0 0.8. Three, the client whose platelet counts 410,000. Or four, the client whose serum glucose is 280. And the correct answer is the glucose is 280. You guys know the normal range of glucose is supposed to be 70 to 110. Her glucose is 280. That's a big problem. Let's look at our other choices. The first choice, and I hope you guys didn't fall for this because it's a trick. So you guys have to know this. Number one, where it says WBC 18,000. 
Well, Professor D, I remember you said the normal WBC is five to 10,000. This is 18,000, so that's way too high. Doesn't that mean she has an infection? Not in maternity, not when the woman's just given birth. Let me explain to you. Right after the woman gives birth, we expect to see the WBC shoot up, okay? And sometimes the WBCs can go as high up to 25,000. That's normal. It's going to shoot up, then it's going to go right back down within 24 to 48 hours, okay? So that's normal. We expect to see the WBC. So that's why we're not concerned about that because we know she just gave birth and we know in maternity, right after mom gives birth, those WBCs elevate. Then the second choice was a creatinine of 0 0.8. Well, we know our normal creatinine is 0 0.8 to 1.3. Some books say 1.4, 1.5, depending on the textbook that you're using, but still it's definitely within limits. And then Third choice was your platelet of 410,000, and we know that platelets are 150,000 to 450,000, so that falls um, perfectly within range as well. So the only abnormality in that choice is the blood glucose, all right? 280 is way too high. Next question. The nurse on the postpartum unit is administering morning medications. Which medication should the nurse administer first? One, the sliding scale insulin to the client diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Two, the stool softener to the client complaining of severe constipation. Three, the non-narcotic analgesic to the client complaining of headache rated as a three on a pain scale of one to 10. Or four, the rectal suppository for a client complaining of hemorrhoidal pain. And the correct answer is giving insulin to that type one. Now, um, if you guys watch my, I've done at least, at least four or five videos on diabetes. That's how important diabetes is, guys. That's how many questions you get di on diabetes on NCLEX. Diabetes is super important. That's why I dedicated so many videos towards it. But if you watch any number of my diabetes videos, I was very clear, those type one diabetics, absolutely must get their insulin and they must get them on time, okay? Type one diabetics are called what? Insulin dependent diabetes. Why? Because they depend on the insulin to live. Yeah. What happens these these type one diabetics, their pancreas is shot. Their pancreas is not um, producing the insulin that normally, you know, Regular people like you and me, our insulin, you know, whenever we eat, our pancreas produces insulin and it brings down our blood sugar. Patients that have type 1 diabetes, right, they rely on an exogenous source. Exogenous, that means an outside source. They rely on an outside source, an exogenous source of insulin to live. Why? Because the their pancreas is not producing insulin at all and they will die without it. So guess what? If you have a list of patients and just like this list, that patient that's a type one diabetic, they have to get their insulin before anyone else, okay? Because their livelihood depends on it. Let's look at our other choices. Two, a stool softener. Constipation never killed anybody, okay? That patient could wait. Uh, three, the non-narcotic analgesic for a patient who has a pain a level three. It's not like the patients at level 10. They're at a level three. Pain never killed anyone except for the situations I told you about earlier. And of course, last but not least, the rectal suppository for the patient with hemorrhoidal pain. Pain never killed anyone except for what? Our sickle cellers, our burn patients, our patients with stones and our myo myocardial infarction patients, okay? So that's why um, the patient who's a type one takes priority over everyone else. Next question. The labor and delivery nurse is performing a vaginal exam and assesses a prolapsed cord. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, place the client in Trendelenburg position. Two, ask the father to leave the delivery room. Three, request that the client not push during contractions. Four, prepare the client for emergency C-section. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer.
and the client is one, the first thing you're going to do is put that patient in Trans-Dellensburg position. Why? You want gravity to assist you. Okay. What happens is it pushes the fetus head back into it puts fetus head. It pushes the fetus uh, back into the uterus, which takes pressure off of the cord. Okay. So it helps with um, circulation. One thing you never, ever, ever, I promise guys, if you see this as an answer choice, and you're about to choose it. Remember Professor D and she threatened to, to wring your neck. You never take your hands, you take your finger and push that cord back in. Absolutely not, okay? You can put mom in Trans-Dellensburg position, okay? To help the fetus go back in to take pressure off the cord. Or if you're unable to do that and you see the fetal head, with a gloved hand, you can lift the head off of the cord to take pressure off the cord, okay? Let's look at our other two choices. Ask the father to leave the delivery room. That doesn't help the mom or the fetus at all. Three, request the client um, not to push during contraction. No, your uh, priority is getting that pressure off of the cord. And four, prepare the client for an emergency section when well, we're not we're not there yet. Like I said, our first priority is getting pressure off the cord. And last question: Which priority intervention should the nurse implement for the 38-week gestation client who's receiving epidural anesthesia? One, place the client in the fetal position. Two, assess the client's respiratory rate. Three, prehydrate the client with IV fluid. Or four, ensure the client has been NPO for four hours. And I'll give you a moment. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is number two, assess their respiratory rate. Why is that important? Because guys, that anesthesia, if it creeps up, right? What can the patient stop doing? They can stop breathing. If it creeps up that spinal cord, that patient can literally stop breathing. So you better be assessing their breathing. Okay. I hope you didn't fall for choice one. Um, when that patient's actually getting the anesthesia, they're going to be getting the anesthesia, not by you, the nurse, they're going to be getting it by the physician. And the physician may have them bend over, curl a little bit for the um, epidural. But your your priority as a nurse is assessing that respiratory function. Um, choice three, prehydrate the client before the IV fluid. No, and so nose number four to... Um, choice number four is wrong as well. Your priority, like I said, is um, assessing respirations. Guys, um... I hope this video was helpful to you. I got lots and lots of comments and requests for OB. I can't believe I'm already at 30 minutes. I feel like I haven't even begun to delve into maternity. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to be making a second video on maternity. Um, if you'd like to see a second video on maternity for me to continue these questions, please put it in the comments. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. And I promise I'll make sure I get a video for you. Thank you so much for joining me. Do not forget, like, comment, subscribe below. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.